This week, just over a year after the White House launched a new U.S. strategy for Africa, we'll examine what has been accomplished amid rapid geopolitical changes. Has it been the grand reset the U.S. and African nations had hoped for? Also, my conversation with former U.S. ambassador to Zimbabwe, Charles Ray, will hear his views on how the U.S. should navigate a rapidly changing political landscape across Africa and how humanity, context and understanding Understanding can help shape stronger foreign relations. Straight Talk Africa starts now. Hello there and a warm welcome to Straight Talk Africa, coming to you from VOA's headquarters in Washington. Just over a year ago, the Biden administration launched its U.S. strategy for Africa. It was meant to redefine and rebuild relations with African countries. Well, today we'll look at what has been accomplished, as well as the state of relations between the United States and a part of the world U.S. President Joe Biden said he recognized as a key geopolitical player. But this new new reimagined relationship between the U.S. and African nations hasn't always been smooth sailing. On Capitol Hill here in Washington, ties between the U.S. and South Africa is under scrutiny, including Pretoria's foreign policy positions. VOA's Ignatius Anno explains. South Africa's growing partnership with Russia and China, U.S. officials say, has its long-standing partner, the United States, unnerved about its future bilateral relationship. That prompted a congressional hearing at the U.S. Capitol, where witnesses gave accounts of how South Africa's foreign policy and that of the ruling party, the African National Congress, or the ANC, does not reflect the position of the South African people. John James is chair of the U.S. Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Africa. South Africa has a choice in what partners to prioritize but so too does the United States. I believe it entirely appropriate to scrutinize the conduct of our important partner when the risks compromising our strong, dynamic, bilateral relationship um, are, are at hand. It's my belief that South Africa is currently in, at an inflection point, and I view the next several months as critical in demonstrating whether it will put our important partnership back on track. Anthony Carroll, is an adjunct professor at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies in Washington. He said, despite the Southern African nation boasting of a very vibrant multi-party democracy with a robust civil society, it is becoming, quote, a failing state, end of quote. He cited its failure to deliver critical public services like electricity and deadly xenophobia as examples. But Carroll said, the African Growth and Opportunity Act, known commonly as AGOA, should not be impacted. While I share the concerns of many about the direction of our relations with South Africa, I would oppose making it ineligible for AGOA. First, I do not believe that its embrace of Russia constitutes a direct threat to U.S. security. Second, goods exported by, to the United States provide critical jobs to South Africa and provide lower priced goods for the U.S. consumers. Third, South Africa's removal from AGO would only play into the hands of anti-U.S. elements within the ANC and the radical EFF party. Reddy Klabi, a South African journalist, cited a recent survey that shows an increasing dissatisfaction of South Africans with democracy. She said, South Africa's democracy must not be left to collapse because, according to her, Russia has been successful in countries where democracy is called flimsy, end of quote. She mentioned Madagascar, Sudan, and the Central African Republic. A strong economy keeps rogue nations out. We have seen Russia's aggressive return and re-engagement with the continent, and we must use the word return and re-engagement because it suggests that there was a time when Russia left Africa, which is not a message that it preaches. Chris Marolan is International Chief Executive Officer at Good Governance Africa, a Johannesburg-based nonprofit organization focused on promoting good governance in Africa. He told the committee that South Africa's neutral position in the Russia-Ukraine conflict is in sharp contrast to the country's constitutional aspirations. Many see strategic non-alignment as incongruent with our constitutional aspirations of human dignity. The achievements of equality and the advancement of human rights and freedom. 
The expert said the US and South Africa have far more in common than with Russia, such as a free press and an independent judiciary. That, they argue, could offer a roadmap to improve relations between the two countries. Ignatius Anno, VO News, Washington. Well, now, more than a year after its launch, what has the U.S. strategy for Africa actually accomplished? Is it still fit for purpose on a continent that has seen dramatic political and economic changes? What has helped and what has hindered U.S. relations with African countries? I'm joined here in studio by Ambassador Rama Yad. She's a former Secretary of State for Human Rights of France and the current Senior Director of the Africa Center at the Atlantic Council here in Washington. Ambassador a warm welcome to Straight Talk Africa, your first time here. Thank you so much for, you for joining us. I and I, I want to start out um, with the strategy itself. Give us your assessment of this U.S. strategy for Africa. Um, we're just over a year in it. Is it hitting all the right notes in Africa? You know, it was the first um, U.S.-Africa summit in eight years. So a lot of expectation expectations, but also a lot of skeptical people about, uh, about this U.S. strategy. Uh, but finally, the summit went well. A lot of commitments, $55 billion over the next three years. Um, a special representative, Ambassador Johnny Carson, for the implementation of the U.S. Africa summit, which means that they want to do a real follow-up. Um, and then a lot of agreements have been signed, you know, from the Artemis Accord on Space with Rwanda and Nigeria uh, to the new uh, regional MCC Millennium Challenge Corporation Compact um, to uh, an MOU on the Africa Free Trade Area. Um, so a lot of commitments and, and, and of course, this uh, support for a G20 uh, permanent seat at the, at the, um, at the, for the African Union. And it happened at the recent uh, early September uh, G20 in New Delhi uh, under the leadership of India. So uh, that's the, the word, the commitment. Um, one year later, like you said, um, a lot happened on the continent, a lot, mm. a lot of changes. Africa has been changing for the last years and there is an acceleration of everything there. And uh, you know about the coup um, in, um, in West Africa, but also in Central Africa with Gabon. Um, these countries questioning the French presence um, in, on the continent and a few frictions with the US um, uh, about this presence, but also a lot of um, discussions about the reforms of Bretton Woods, um, the global state that is um, changing a lot, the BRICS summit um, in, in August, you know, with the enlargement, with six new members. Um, you have also the Russia-Africa summit um, in July, uh, with a commitment from Russia to Africa, and this war in Ukraine in the middle um, as a key point of these frictions between the, what we name the global south, including Africa and the north. So there are a lot of stakes around uh, since the U.S. Africa summit um, that was um, that wanted to be a reset of the Africa-U.S. Uh, relations. You know, after the Trump administration, he never visited the continent, and uh, this administration uh, pledged to do it. Um, in the first three months of 2023, um, high-level officials visited 18 African countries. It is unprecedented, including Jill Biden, the First Lady, and Kamala Harris, um, before uh, Joe Biden himself, who said he would do the same uh, before the end of his presidency. Right. He hasn't come yeah. to the African continent yet, yet either. Yet. Um, but, Madam, today we see, of course, the United States has an Africa strategy. France has one. Um, Russia has one, too. To. Is it a good idea, given the changes we see on the continent and given the fact that the African countries, each one has, a, has their own interests, has their own trajectory, has their own ideals and ambitions, is it a good idea for individual powers in the West mm -hmm. um, to have a strategy for a continent of yeah. 54 countries? Yeah, uh, 54, 55, that's right. And, um, and Africa is, um, is very diverse, you're right. Um, and uh, there's a lot of different various realities, economically speaking, from low-income countries, middle-income countries, and, and powers like uh, Nigeria, first economy of Africa, and South Africa, too. Um, the, um, 
the, you know, the differences are strong between the West and, and, and the South, etc. That's absolutely right. But um, this is a shift. This continental vision is, is a shift. Uh, during the Cold War, it was different. It was an individual conversation with individual African countries because it was like a trade. Um, you know, and a lot of Africans were reluctant to this trade, like, uh, we support you in our, uh, you know, we support you, we give you support, we back you, the regime, we give you um, uh, economic and financial um, uh, funds and supports, and uh, you help us in our war against uh, the, the Soviet Union, you know. And this kind of trade had a huge price, democracy, because some Western countries backed uh, author some authoritarian regimes, uh, just because they were they supported the Western strategy to the Soviet Union in the Cold War. So um, having a continental vision is something new and appreciated on the continent because they see the emergence of a of a continental power because that's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, Africa is the, the the oldest continent of the world, the youngest too, but very soon at the end of the century, uh, the largest. You know, and uh, they are building the largest free trade area in the world, and this free trade area, free trade area is continental and will boost the trade between the African countries, which that they could not do before because of the colonial legacy. You know, it's also the continent where you have the most um, dynamic economies in terms of growth. Um, you have also uh, the hub of green technologies, so important for the green transition in the world. So all these new realities are continental, mm -hmm. and it's appreciated to see the continent as um, um, an emergent. Uh, continent, but you're right. It's not because it's a it's a continental vision that we should not see the differences. The reality of Niger experiencing a coup right now has nothing to do with Nigeria, which successfully had um, held um, a presidential election. Uh, and is a democracy. So that has to be taken into consideration. And those dynamics, those Cold War era dynamics that you mentioned earlier are still playing out, of course, uh, today. And um, if we look at sort of this, um, this idea of whose friend is whom and whose enemy is whom, how do, you, how do these countries, the United States and African countries, overcome the sort of dis disconnect? around friends and enemies, where the United States is saying to African countries, hey, your friend is our enemy, yeah. and African countries are saying, like Nelson Mandela said, you cannot expect your enemy to be our enemy, yeah. that your enemy is our friend. So where there are those dynamics, how do you overcome that? You are right to, to, um, to mention Nelson Mandela, because uh, we are, uh, very soon we are celebrating um, the, the, um, the anniversary of, of his death, uh, 10 years, and, um, and he's still inspiring uh, the, the continent. And, uh, and, and South Africa is experiencing uh, what you just said um, to Russia uh, in this relationship between Russia and, and the United States. It's very complicated uh, to, uh, to be in the middle and uh, to make choices, uh, you know, um, given what's going on around the war in Ukraine. And of course, there's a lot of pressure from the West uh, to drag uh, the African countries into the support of, of, of Ukrainians. And, um, and, and the problem is African countries doesn't, don't want to be dragged into this war and, or in some new Cold War. And we have seen that at the, at the United Nations when it comes to voting uh, to condemn Russia or support the Ukrainians, uh, Africans are divided. You have this, um, you have, we have had a lot of votes these past months and um, a lot of African countries wanted to stay, uh, remain far from this and stay um, uh, neutral and they abstained. And that's something the, the, the Western countries uh, from the US to France don't understand and don't accept and that's maybe that's why uh, we have all these gatherings international summits around Africa you know uh, to try to convince them to make the right choice when it comes to the war in Ukraine like the respect of sovereignty of a nation that is what is at stake on the line for West
Westerns, but for Africans it's different. It's like, okay, but what uh, Russia is doing, you already did the same, um, and you are still doing the same, so, um, and we don't want to be dragged into this, and we have our own wars, and you are not so committed in our own wars. Look, the DRC and the East, where so many massacres uh, uh, happened there. So that's the reasons why uh, we have these frictions around the world. Well, there, there are so many more things we need to discuss, Ambassador, that I have to invite you back onto the show again <laughs> in future. So. Thank, Thank you, you so much me. for joining us. Really a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. And that was Ambassador Rama Iyade. She speaking to us from um, here in our studios in Washington. She is with the Atlantic Council. Still ahead here on Straight Talk Africa. My conversation with a former U.S. ambassador to Zimbabwe, Charles Ray, will talk about his time as a U.S. diplomat in Africa. He'll also give us some insight into his complex and surprising relationship with a former Zimbabwean president, the late Robert Mugabe. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. In times of change, when the world seems uncertain, and what we hear doesn't reflect what we see. We seek the truth. When we are told only part of the story, we lose trust. In moments of crisis, our dreams, hopes, and wishes for a better tomorrow depend on a free press. At Voice of America, we bring you the stories that people take risks to see. We connect the world and unite it with truth. At Voice of America, we show you the whole picture. You're with Straight Talk Africa. Welcome back. He spent three decades in the U.S. Foreign Service with postings to Sierra Leone, China, Thailand and Vietnam. He also served as the U.S. Ambassador to Zimbabwe and Cambodia. My guest this week is Charles Ray. We sat down here in Washington. He spoke to me about what makes good diplomacy and good foreign relations in difficult times and difficult places. Here's our conversation. Ambassador Charles Ray, thank you so very much for your time and thank you so much for coming in and talking to us. I want to get straight into it. Um, when the U.S. strategy for Africa was launched just um, over a year ago, the Biden administration said it wanted to chart a new direction for U.S.-Africa relations. We've seen U.S. support for Africa to have a greater voice and greater representation um, in more global institutions. For example, the G8, that was something that actually materialized. And and of course, there has been support for Africa to have a greater voice at the UN Security Council that has not materialized. But we also saw relations between the United States and a key Africa partner, South Africa, come under some strain going through a really rough time in, in recent months. Um, and much of that has been over Pretoria's relationship with Moscow. Uh, when you look at the rhetoric around charting a new direction, and what actually happens when Russia becomes part of the conversation? Do you see a new direction? I see the potential for a new direction. I think the, the key is to be realistic in what we can achieve as opposed to what we would like to achieve. I mean, aspirational in reality or aspirations in reality are sometimes separated by a chasm of misunderstanding. <laughs> Uh, but it's, it's really a matter of us educating ourselves more on, on the realities, on the complexities of, of Africa, and then, and then moderating our expectations uh, to, 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 to accompany that. I mean, just to, to the, the South Africa uh, situation is a good example. South Africa, since 1994, has been essentially ruled by the ANC. The ANC was for a long time considered a terrorist organization by the U.S. government. It has been, from the beginning, a leaning to the left associated with the South African Communist Party, supported by uh, the Soviet Union. And those are historical facts and realities, which I think sometimes 
we here in the United States forget. Um, and, and one of the issues on, on the entire continent, in fact, that we need to, to really get our minds around is that, it, first of all, um, and, and, I, and I know with the discussions lately about the age of our leaders, this might sound a little off kilter, but the fact is that, that the, the leadership in Africa is old. I mean, I don't know, the average age of, of the uh, heads of state in Africa is, what, 65 or so? Uh, on a continent where the vast majority of the people are under 25. Now, the, the thing that we have to keep in mind is that those leaders of that age are the independence, the liberation generation, who are very much products of their history. And their history is, it was the Soviets, it was the Chinese who helped them gain their independence, while we, for what were, what were to us at the time practical reasons, supported the European colonial masters. Uh, and I'm sorry, but if we expect people who lived through that to just suddenly completely forget it, we need to look at our own history and how many people in this country are still fighting the Civil War, who definitely weren't born or living during that period. So, so we need to have a better understanding of the historical context of the people we're dealing with. You have some people in the ANC who I think are practical and see the, the economic benefits of close ties to the U.S. and the West. You have others who would just much prefer we send the money and we stay home uh, and who will never be pro-U.S. And, and, and as we've seen here in the U.S., a small vocal minority can, can drive the train. You said earlier that, you know, the United States does not have a perfect democratic system. And we have seen in recent years America's own democracy shaken. Um, for a long time, it has been seen as one of America's biggest exports. Um, but does America today still have the credibility to retain that, um, especially in a world where democracy is under threat. We see populism on the rise. Uh, what kind of example does the United States set? Well, I mean, right now we probably aren't setting the best example in a general sense. In another sense, this can be, I think, a teaching moment. Uh, you know, one of the issues that, that I faced as a diplomat I, I just is, is that when you, when you receive your instructions to deal with foreign governments, sometimes the people who write the instructions don't take into account the, the domestic environment that they themselves are living in. If, if, for example, you're going into a government to talk to them about upcoming elections and the fact that they have to run a perfect election, right after we had a less than perfect election in 2000, um, that could present a problem. But it also presents an opportunity. Um, when I had to go into foreign ministries or government officials or even talking to public audiences about their country and the state of democracy and their country and their problems, human rights and you know treatment of minorities, I would always introduce it by saying, you know, in the United States, we sometimes have the very same problems you have, but we have institutions to which people can turn to get redress. It doesn't always work right away. Sometimes it doesn't work at all, but the, but the mechanism, the structure is there, and that's what you need to look at in your country. Elections are just one component of it. You also have to have institutions that, that support and undergird democracy. You have to have a, a citizenry that understands their democratic rights and responsibilities and are active in exercising it. And you have to work at it.
Ambassador, you were the ambassador, the US ambassador to Cambodia and Zimbabwe. Um, can you briefly give us some insight into some of the challenges that ambassadors face, especially um, when they have to advocate for US policies that might not be popular or align with the policies of the host government or the country where they are posted? Well, I mean, as an ambassador, you have to support the policy decided by the, the duly elected leaders of your government. Um, and, and so, whether you agree with them or not. And, and I have no problem with that. I mean, it's because, you know, one of the things that I always tell young people when I talk to them is stand on your principles and stand for what's right. But remember, you could be wrong. When I was in Zimbabwe, uh, President Mugabe's sister died. And I was invited along with the rest of the diplomatic corps to the funeral. We were seated in a tent a mile away from the, the main stage not that far, but probably an eighth of a mile. Um, and so we could, we could just see the little figures at the podium uh, and we could hear because of the speakers. And he was delivering his sister's eulogy. And, and as he was wont to do when he was in front of a crowd of very ardent Mugabe supporters, he would, he would get into his shtick of neo-colonialism and fighting off the perfect the you know the evil Brits and and their and their naive American allies uh, and he just he, he, and he switched from the Shona that he had been speaking into English and he just got into a really really virulent uh, anti-European anti-American thing and and at one point and he said you know we were trying to recolonize the country, but as long as he lived, it would never happen to hell with Europe, to hell with America, to hell, hell, hell. And I almost got up and walked out at that point, but my German colleague restrained me and said, let him finish talking first. And we did. And when he sat down, we stood up and left. The foreign ministry, I mean, he didn't see this. Uh, someone from the foreign ministry did and reported it to the foreign minister. And of course, the German ambassador and I got called in uh, and, and, you know, harangued. I walked out on the foreign minister, but that, that's another story. Uh, but the point was, when I was interviewed, I gave an interview to the media, to the state media, and I explained that I felt insulted by, by what he said. And when he finished saying it and sat down, I left because I felt I wasn't welcome. And if you insult my country, I'm sorry, I'm going to react. That's just, you know, that's, that's what I get paid for. That aired. Uh, on state TV aired my statement without, without any edits. edits at all. About, and there was about three or four days of just really vicious editorials and articles in the Herald, uh, the, the state-run paper. And then after about a week, it just stopped. It just, you know, nothing else was said about it. And then about five or six days after that, I asked for a meeting with, with Mugabe to talk about it. We had a 45-minute extremely cordial meeting, half of which we spent talking about the merits of, of regular and extra crispy Kentucky Fried Chicken. Okay? And the, the, the foreign minister who was sitting there, who was still upset with me, was sitting there slack-jawed. One of the young guys in his office who I knew well and, and got along with, later told me that when, when Mugabe himself found out about the, this whole mess, he, he would never apologize directly to me, but he, he recognized that under African customs, he was the offender because you do not offend guests in African culture. And I was a guest and it wasn't his intent to offend me, he was talking to his supporters. I mean, the fact is that when you deal with people on a human level, you can get things done. If you, if you pigeonhole them, if you, if you stereotype them, and then you react to them as if they're that stereotype, they're going to live up to the stereotype. Well, nothing like Kentucky Fried Chicken diplomacy. And that was former ambassador to Zimbabwe, Charles Ray, speaking to me here in Washington. That's our show for this week. Thank you for always watching and for always listening. I will see you next time. Until then, goodbye.